Thank you very much, Roderick. Um, copies of the flyer coupon for Roderick and uh, Tibor's book will be available on the complimentary literature table in the conservatory. Uh, copies of the other three books are available in the bookstore um, here today. Our next speaker is Dr. Thomas Woods, my colleague and senior fellow here at the Ludwig von Mises <coughs> Institute, and he will be discussing his book on 33 questions in American history. by far the shortest this morning. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have a certain unfair advantage because my book is shorter than Guido's and cheaper than Roderick's. Fly off the shelf. 33 questions about American history you're not supposed to ask, so you can see the Uncle Sam figure indicating that you should not be asking these things. I've had people wonder where the number 33 came from. And I honestly had somebody suggest that it's my way of, of, of sending code to my fellow Masons that I'm a 33 degree. <laughs> I don't belong to any secret organizations, although I will have to leave the conference early to make it out to the Bohemian Grove. <laughs> now, I, I wrote this because uh, I, I thought with my politically incorrect guide to American history. I hadn't gotten into enough trouble and my life was getting boring again so I came out with this and I thought you know if, the, if you thought that one was controversial you know this one makes that one look like a picnic so I took 33 different topics that are in, that I find interesting and that I think are covered very badly or even more inexcusably not covered at all and in fact if you look through these 33 questions you'll find that this is material that you won't get in school. I mean, you absolutely won't get it. And that's not just a marketing ploy on my part. You absolutely will not get this material. I'm going to discuss a few of the questions, but all 33 of the questions are actually posted on the, I have a website, thomasewoods.com, and on the 33 questions page, I have a link to the Library of Congress page that, that lists all 33 questions. Uh, the, an easier way to, to figure this out, what the 33 questions are, would be to look at the table of contents by picking one up in the bookstore, although you know the bookstore policy is uh, you touch it, you bought it. <laughs> I made that up. That's not true. That's not true at all. But let me start very briefly with the way the book begins, which in a kind of a preface, I talk about something that I'm sure some of you folks know about, so I'll, I'll keep it very brief. H.L. Uh, Mencken's story of the bathtub. In 1917, H.L. Mencken wrote an article lamenting the fact that here it was, the 75th anniversary of the bathtub, of its invention, and no sector of society is commemorating this. So he's going to rectify this outrage, and he goes on and explains that the bathtub was invented in the early 1840s uh, by a fellow in Ohio, and he went on and explained that early on it was a very primitive sort of thing. It was, it was little more than uh, a glorified dishpan, he said. And then later on, people realized that if you install pipes, it was easier than lugging the water up w by a servant and then dumping it all out later. You could dump it out through the pipes and channel it in through the pipes. And initially, the invention was met with a skepticism from the medical community, which argued that it was a health hazard, potential health hazard much better for people to walk around filthy and disgusting with <laughs> bugs on them. We don't want uh, the bathtub. Uh, it was also argued that this was a luxury that would undermine the Republican simplicity of American society. So the, the Spartan contingent had its, had its say. Well, finally, all these fears were laid to rest when, of course, the U.S. president, who always leads us in cultural matters, <laughs> Millard Fillmore, installed the first bathtub in the White House, and then that... Uh, that was that. Well, every aspect of that story is a big old lie. <laughs> Mencken made the whole thing up just to sort of 
play with people, but also to try to show how propaganda gets started. Now notice he's writing this, he's writing it in December 1917, so the middle of U.S. involvement in World War I. So part of the argument is, look at how war propaganda gets started. You say one ridiculous thing, other people pick it up. But war propaganda, of course, is somewhat different. It's not just a cutesy little story about a bathtub. Governments have an interest in promoting war propaganda. So it isn't just that people unthinkingly repeat what they're told. It's that governments have an incentive to repeat these types of statements over and over and over again, so this is all people hear. But what Mencken said was that what struck him was that he was able to get away with this simply by writing an article with an authoritative sounding tone and referring to authoritative sounding periodicals like the Western Medical Quarterly. There's no such thing as the Western Medical Quarterly. He just made that up. He said, I started getting letters from people giving me evidence corroborating my story of the bathtub. How can you corroborate a story that I made up? None of this happened. He said, to be honest with you, I have no idea what the story of the bathtub is. No idea. And if I did know, it would probably be a complete bore. So he then said that he started hearing members of Congress repeating this on, this on the House floor, whatever, about the history of the bathtub, although heaven knows why this would be relevant to congressional work. I'll leave that to your imagination. But finally, he said it even began popping up in official reference works. What is this doing in official I'm what part have I made up this story are you people not getting? So, so again, it's an interesting object lesson because he goes on to say that much of what we take for granted as true consists of a lot of phony and fraudulent claims like this that just get repeated over and over again until people, you know, in effect zombie-like, just utter them on command. So, for instance, things like what we hear today. I mean, you hear professional economists saying World War II got us out of the Great Depression. They all say that. Paul Krugman, all these people who write for the New York Times, all say uh, crazy things like this all the time as, a, as just a, as a reflex, uh, it seems. So there, is, there does seem to be some merit to, to Mencken's contention. Well, one of the points that I make in the conclusion to the book is that when you go to school, particularly in government-run schools, what is the story that you get about the U.S. government? Well, by and large, the story you get is that if it weren't for the U.S. government, all you kids would probably be working in mines, you know, barely eking out some kind of existence. You might all be dead. Um, all these sorts of things. The private sector is this predatory place where wicked people are competing with each other in a dog-eat-dog -dog fashion and only because of government or blah, blah, blah. It's this sort of thing all the time, right? In fact, just the other day, somebody emailed me. It couldn't even be somebody in this room. Somebody emailed me a, P a, 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 a JPEG of just a couple of facing pages in a standard, absolutely typical American history textbook for high schools. And it was the section on the Federal Reserve System. Well, what do you think it said? Well, what would you think a government-run school would say about the Federal Reserve System created by an act of Congress? Well, uh, without the Federal Reserve System, we, we, would have, uh, we would have lagged behind other countries. It would have been a disaster. And, Thankfully, because of the Federal Reserve System, we can pump in as much money as the legitimate needs of business demand. <laughs> hmm. Of course, they'll be there to determine what are the legitimate needs of business and just how much money business needs. But again, so I'm not claiming in the book that it's a, it's a deliberate conspiracy, that people are in smoke-filled rooms saying, ah, what are we going to teach the kiddies now? Well, how are we going to teach them to enslave themselves to us? But what I do want to suggest is, suppose they did do that. Suppose there were a big conspiracy, and the idea was we're going to use the education system to make kids into zombies who accept the official government line on everything. How would the textbooks be any different? <laughs> Right, right. In fact, uh, I don't have it on me, but I gave a talk over at Auburn not long ago, and one of the students in attendance had a, had a lapel pin with a sheep with a line drawn through it. <laughs> and I said to him, I love your pin. And he took it off. He said, oh, here, take it, have it. I said, no, 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 I'm just complimenting you. He said, no, I insist, you take it. 
So I've started complimenting people a lot more since then. Love your car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's a that's a fine car. <laughs> well, what are some examples that I have here in the book? Well, one of them is one of them involves the subject of, of wages and standard of living. Because I remember from my own experience in junior high and high school, that was absolutely the impression I got. That if it weren't for some unspecified government activity, again, we would all be earning just pennies an hour, and, and we would be earning less and less over time. And you know, I forget exactly who said this, but if the argument were true that the rich always get richer and the poor always get poorer, and that's just the way history has gone, wouldn't all the poor have long since died off? Like, how would any of them have survived? How could they get any poorer at some level, right? <laughs> Ultimately, once you hit subsistence, if you get any poorer... So what I wanted to do was to show that, in fact, it's the natural tendency of a market economy, unhampered by the sort of restrictions uh, under which we li live and labor, of course, uh, for wages, real wages, to increase over time. And so I show the mechanism uh, for that. And it's just, again, these are the beautiful thing about these chapters is that they're so short. You can just... Boom, you can just go through them quickly. I've had people say that this makes a very good uh, book for bathroom reading. I, 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 I'm taking that as a compliment because it can be read in short, short bits and then you can get up and resume your activity, I guess. I don't know. So, but, that's the sort of, but the idea is that a student, for example, could get this basic understanding really quickly, that, an understanding that the teacher has never heard, and then go in there and not necessarily, you don't necessarily want to challenge your teacher and be hated and get an F, you don't necessarily want to do that, but at least you can sit there with a knowing smile, you know, <laughs> as the propaganda just flows right on over, you just know. <laughs> you're, not, you're not taking me in. But also, for example, labor unions. Now, my father was a teamster. My, my late father, but he's not rolling in his grave because he didn't like the Teamsters either. Uh, he had nothing, nothing but contempt for them because he felt like he worked hard and he felt like he was a sucker for... But anyway, I'll tell you the Teamster stories later. That's not really my point. My point is that in my chapter on labor unions, which, again, is another thing you get in, in school, right? If it weren't for labor unions, again, everybody would be dead and, 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 uh, and, you know, employers are walking around with money bags with dollar signs on them. It's the sort of view you get. But I'm trying to give a kind of a balanced view of the, of the overall uh, effect of labor unions. And I'm talking about coercive labor unions, of course. Um, it has been disputed whether there could just simply be voluntary unions. And of course, a, a, a libertarian has no problem with people voluntarily organizing according to trade. But in practice, there tends to be a coercive element. I, I think it was Henry George who said that... Uh, you know, you tell me about a trade union that operates on nonviolent principles, and I'll tell you about tigers who live on oranges. <laughs> well, I just wanted to, I just give a few examples of the sorts of things that American labor law has given us that you, that, needless to say, you don't hear about in a textbook. So the Wagner Act, for example, it's right out of the book, allows strikers to use the picket line to try to prevent their employer from gaining access to other workers as well as to prevent the arrival of deliveries and the entry of customers onto his property, employers can even be compelled to rehire strikers guilty of violence. And according to a ruling by the National Labor Relations Board, whether strikers accused of such offenses should get their jobs back depends on whether their conduct, quote, is so violent or of such serious character as to render the employees unfit for further service, or whether it amounted to only a, quote, trivial rough incident perpetrated in, quote, a moment of animal exuberance. Um, because such cases of, quote, impulsive behavior were, quote, normal outgrowths of the intense feelings developed on picket lines. And according to Charles Baird, a labor economist, excused cases of animal exuberance have included beatings, stabbings, bombings, threatening of non-strikers' families, destruction of property, blocking entrances to struck firms with broken glass and nails, and hurling brickbats. So if you get a brick in the face, this is just animal exuberance and you're being unreasonable. What my goal is with a book like this is to really to draw people to some of our authors and some of our literature. So, for example, I mentioned Bob Higgs, but there are others, uh, a great many others in our, our tradition. Because what I do is give summaries of controversial questions 
or well, if only there were a controversy, questions where there is only one side given, give the other side, and then people can be referred in my endnotes to reliable authors, to people who, again, who have, have some kind of Austrian formation, and therefore they can understand what really happened and then be brought, I think, closer to an understanding of, of the free society. So there's a very short overview of Austrian business cycle theory, which I think is going to be even better and better received given the times we live in, and that's in the context of discussing the Great Depression. So again, maybe five or six pages, and you, you got a basic understanding of why it is that the business cycle should not be put at the, the feet of the market uh, for, for blame. The subject of, of, uh, of foreign aid, uh, I, I cover there as well. I, I said once that I would support foreign aid only if I hated the human race, and then somebody started a Facebook group called I would support foreign aid only if I hated the human race. And he made me an administrator of this group. <laughs> and although I'm not that old, this is a sort of generational thing, I have no idea what that means. What my responsibilities are. I haven't done a thing with this thing. I, have not, I don't know what's going on. There could be bodies all over the floor. I don't know what's going on. So uh, what, uh, what we also cover in here is first, when I talk about foreign aid, I mean, this is sort of an area that is kind of red meat for for old-fashioned old conservatives, too. Like, yeah, I don't want to send my money to those deadbeats overseas, and they get really worked up. And Of course, foreign aid is a tiny percentage of the federal budget, but that doesn't mean we can't still hammer away at it, because a lot of the reasons foreign aid is a bad idea uh, are reasons that other uh, sort of domestic programs are, are bad ideas. But by the 1980s, it was being conceded by people on all sides that the development aid programs since the late 40s and 50s really hadn't worked and had possibly been counterproductive. But, but of course, the, the immediate qualification came, uh, the caveat came that how could we have known this? No one warned us that these programs weren't going to work. They, we had the best of intentions. And poor Peter Bauer, you know, what's left of him is trying to raise his hand in the background. Well, you know, I, I built my career trying to warn you morons that all these programs were simply going to entrench rotten regimes in power and that they were simply going to encourage the predatory sector of society, namely the state, because people would abandon their normal pursuits of trying to please consumers and instead channel their energies into trying to get some of the foreign aid loot. I mean, I did try to, I mean, he really should have written a, a book that was more of an I told you so book uh, before his death. I, I mentioned in, in one of my other books that, uh, what, was the, what was the guy's name? who Robert Conquest, you know, the old British historian of the, of, of communism, and conquest for years, people had said that conquest had overstated the evils of communism. He was exaggerating. And then when, you know, more and more evidence came to light, uh, conquest said that he, uh, when he was asked uh, by his publisher, do you want to uh, change the title of your book, The Great Terror, for the new edition? And uh, he said, yes, I would. I I'd like to call it, I told you so, you blanking fools. <laughs> So anyway, Bauer should have done that, because by the 1990s, even the New York Times admitted that these programs weren't working. So the Times took its usual, usual at least 10-year lag to get with everybody else on, on something. But at least they did admit it. But again, nobody could have known. We all had the best of intentions. But now, in the first number of years of the 21st century, nevertheless, the same arguments that were advanced for foreign aid have been advanced again in what's called the new economics of foreign aid. But when you look closely at it, it's the same old economics of foreign aid. It's just the new guys just never read the old stuff, basically. So, because what they're trying to argue is that foreign aid can work fine as long as we direct it to relatively non-predatory regimes. I mean, as long as we direct it to countries where, you know, the president doesn't, you know, eat people. You know, then maybe it would work. We'd have better results with it. But I, I reply to that too, that the foreign aid, the aid itself is, is a bad, it's a bad in and of itself. It's not a good program gone bad, it's a bad in and of itself, and that even when these, these uh, monies are directed in that way, it still has uh, bad problems. Well, just so I can leave a few minutes for questions, I'll just say that there are a lot of things covered in here from the Balkans to George Washington Carver. Now, they're not, George Washington Carver is not necessarily a libertarian issue, but it, it is a kind of a question of how myths get spread. We all have heard that George Washington Carver uh, created 300 products out of the peanut, and that uh, Henry Ford called him the greatest scientific genius that, that America had ever produced, and so on and on. But 
when you asked him, could you give us a list of these products, he, he really wouldn't give you one and say that, well, the list is always changing. I don't want to pin myself down. Or, well, could you at least tell us how you're making these products? Well, and like, how are you learning this? And his answer was, I, I don't study through books. I, I just get it from divine revelation. Well, some scholars started to think that maybe there's a little bit something that's kind of fishy about this. And then you look at the products, and salted peanuts is listed as one of the products. I mean, <laughs> come on now. You know, I think that's, they just want to reach that magic number 300, so we talk about that there. George Washington Carver was a perfectly competent and accomplished scientist. There was no reason to portray him as the greatest mind of all time. This is just silly, uh, but it's what the, the kids get taught. And then finally in there, uh, I haven't even touched the, the tip of the iceberg, but there are the three constitutional clauses you can drive a truck through, the general welfare, the commerce clause, and necessary and proper. And I go through and try to give a kind of a rendering of what these clauses were intended to mean. And I'm sometimes taken to task for this, by the way, that I'm, I'm a constitutional fetishist, that as a libertarian, I shouldn't care about the Constitution. You know, I mean, liberty is all that matters, and who cares about the Constitution? And to a certain extent, that argument is all well and good, and I'm familiar with the Spooner argument, but um, why do I focus on these cl clauses and constitutional arguments? Well, to show that the government is a bunch of liars. Like, isn't that worth a worthwhile project? To show that they're liars, that they, they can't even be bound by the rules they themselves established. Isn't that a useful sort of proselytizing point about the nature of how governments work? So. I, in, in conclusion, I'll just simply say that when I was growing up, this would have been a useful book for me to have so that I wouldn't have had to spend so much time researching every one of these topics. I would have had a brief intro to, to, to each of these topics with all the good, reliable people listed in the end notes and could have saved myself a lot of time and wouldn't have had to have this eyeglass prescription, but that's the way life is. So thank you all very much for your attention. Okay. Um, uh, yes, sir. Oh, good question. I don't. Kn I think the institute is selling it for twenty-five dollars. I, I don't know that for sure, but the list price is twenty-five ninety-five. So you're even getting a slight a break. Uh, yes. Oh, good. I wanted to come to that paper. Good. Okay, yeah. Qu question involves, uh, did, did I talk about uh, war propaganda as one of the questions? Uh, well, as I say, in connection with Mencken, I, I made that World War I point. But on war, I, the th things I covered were presidential war powers and the phony arguments they make for that. The, um, the Civil War, I talked about some of the moral dimension to it, even acknowledging the slavery aspect. Uh, nevertheless, I think I make a pretty compelling moral case for... Um, you know, for some kind of nonviolent resolution to the to the slavery issue, and there was a minority tradition among abolitionists that took that view, so that's that's addressed in there. What other thing? Oh yeah, on a kind of war propaganda thing is the suggestion that you know we've got liberals who are anti-war and conservatives who are pro-war, and and I mean I suppose to a certain extent that's a that can be a useful shorthand, but I also show I show that mainstream liberalism, not not like the good the good lefties we all sort of admire, but um, but the mainstream left has, by and large, either gone along with or been at the forefront of the major American wars. So I, I do have that in there. But in terms of Hiroshima, I didn't, I didn't cover that. Um, but it's an interesting topic to me, and I'd like to hear what uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. I will say that I was on a radio program. I don't want to say the guy's name, but he's a former uh, star in a, in a science fiction television series. I told Roderick about this, and uh, he had me on, and he's a perfectly nice guy, but. As they're setting up my appearance, I'm on the line, ready to go, and the way he sets it up is to say, I can't believe these liberals who are going around saying we didn't have to do the atomic bombings of, in Japan, you know, because blah, 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 we had to do it to stop the war and, and save lives and this and that. My next guest is Tom Woods, who's going to help us puncture myths like this. And I thought, oh, you are killing me, man. Why are you doing this to me? So I thought, well, look, you know, I'm just here to promote my book. If he doesn't bring this up again, I'm just here to promote my book, and then we'll, you know, deal with the sackings later. But in fact, that was the first thing he put to me. You know, don't you, isn't this just outrageous? 
So I explained to him, well, you know, actually, I, I, I would be morally opposed to these uh, bombings. And then I went on and explained to him, to his shock and horror, that um, conservatives like Henry Regnery and Richard Weaver and Eric von kunelt ledeen people he was very familiar with and had read their whole corpus. Um, so, oh, that's not nice. The guy has me on his show, and all I do is badmouth him a year later. But I, I said that actually these people had been just as horrified. They thought it was an example of the, just the complete lack of, of moral uh, moorings in the West uh, any longer, that L'Osservatore Romano, which is the, basically the mouthpiece of the Vatican, condemned the bombings. And I said, I don't think Pius XII was a, a liberal by any standards I'm familiar with. So the, the, the subject was quickly changed. But he didn't assault me at that point. He, and I even said, and Pat Buchanan, in his autobiography, uh, says that this is just uh, monstrous, morally monstrous, and I, I don't think Pat Buchanan's on the left. So he just moved along to the next thing, and I thought, well, you know, I think I acquitted myself the best I could on that question. Now, I think we, we can maybe take one more. Uh, yes, sir? Um, I am uh, not a scholar of Austrian economics or Austrian really, but I heard someone say one time that the lobbyists, some of the, one of the lobbyists show up Foreign aid hearings in Washington is Caterpillar. If, if foreign aid is passed, they get to sell equipment to mm. those who try to get tested. So, therefore, isn't American business, or perhaps other countries, very much in collusion with mm. weapons? And in fact, most of them were financed by American business. Right. Well, that's an excellent question. How do we get out of that? Oh, well, the how do we, I, I'm sorry, I can never answer a how do we. I wish I could. Um, I'm, I'm only the what happened guy. <laughs> you guys have to figure out how we get out of it. But the question involves foreign aid, and, and uh, the, the, the Caterpillar company seems to be one of the people who would be at these, uh, among the lobbyists for more foreign aid, because the more foreign aid, the more rebuilding and reconstruction, whatever, the more equipment they sell. Uh, and so, you know, are, isn't this a collusion between big business and government? And yeah, yeah, of course it is. And in fact, some foreign aid programs are premised on the idea that the aid has to be spent on products from American companies. But of course, the companies will portray this in, in television commercials as just how selfless they are and committed the, to the common good. And oh man, it's just to the point where they've taken what could be possibly a perfectly good phrase like common good and just made it into something that just makes you physically ill every time you hear it. So uh, if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. Okay.